This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. And all that you really have time to do because you see an 18-wheeler coming down the road. You're in a dangerous situation. You don't have time to go through form and formality. Anybody ever been there when something hits you and you are so dumbfounded, so stunned by it, that all that you can do is call on the name of the Lord. You don't have time to go, our Father, the one who sits high and looks low, but you begin to call on that name that is above every name. You don't even have time to do that because sometimes things are coming at you so fast as life is buffeting you one blow after another and all that you have time to do is call the name Jesus and I'm telling you in a moment of time when you don't have time to say anything else you don't have time to go in his Hebrew name and Greek name and El Shaddai but all that you do know is the name Jesus and I'm telling you that's power power Wonder working power. My God, I'm telling you, that name, that name invokes his presence in a way that is inexplicable. I, I don't know how to explain how he responds to it. But there's something about your calling that name when you don't know anything else to do that summons the presence of God into your situation in a divine way like nobody's business. And I don't know who this is for today. I'm glad that I am free to flow in the prophetic. And all that I can tell you is that God has not forgotten about you. Though things have been delayed, it may look grim to you and some of you have lost your hope and you're wondering, God, what's up? I've already made my new God. I'm waiting on you now. What you doing? Any time now will be okay with me. And we forget that God doesn't wear a watch. He doesn't live in time. Before time existed, God was. And he is and he shall be. He's the one who was and is and is to come. And I just want you to know that this wonderful King of glory that we serve, when you just like Mary and Martha are coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, had you been here, had you shown up when I call you, my brother wouldn't have died. My business wouldn't have gone under. My book would have made it. My record would have been successful. My marriage would have worked. My healing would have been consummated. But let me just remind you that what you're waiting on, that you're blaming him for, Jesus is really saying there's no need to be in a rush. It's not dead, it's just sleep. Sleep means that it is able to be recovered. And Jesus knew that he was going to wake him up because here's where Mary and Martha missed it. Jesus said, you're going to see your brother again. They said, yeah, yeah, I know about the resurrection. But they understood the resurrection to be an event. But the resurrection is a person. Jesus said, you're looking. more <laughs> You are looking at what you're waiting on. It is not that. If you get this, you'll get that. But he says, get this. Get this. The resurrection, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And if any man liveth and believeth in me, he'll never die. And if any man is already dead, he shall live.
Jesus is saying, it's not about the event that you're waiting to happen. Jesus says, get your eyes on me. Look at me. I'm the one that will speak and cause your dreams to live. I'll speak and every prophetic word will rise up and stand at attention and things that were not in existence. God says, I'll call the money in. I'll call the people in. I'll call the help in. I'll call the partners in. I'll call the deal in. I'll call the bankers in. I'll give you approval. I'll give you my favor. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God said, I've got everything that you need. You are not waiting on a part, on an event. You're waiting on a person. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, that's just your appetizer today. Sometimes... I've gone to restaurants and sometimes the appetizer was better than the meal. And uh, have you ever been to a restaurant and you really wanted the appetizer as your entree? My God, I'm so glad that... Our scriptural lesson today is coming from St. John chapter 15, verses 4 through 11. Notice there in the, in the New Living Translation, the word of the Lord. Jesus is speaking here. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. And when you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I'm talking today from the subject, for the long haul. For the long haul. For the long haul. Here, I want you to understand that Jesus is actually challenging His followers to remain in him, to remain connected to him. And sometimes I've watched the poor uh, manifestation of a person's life still looking as though it is fruitful because it was connected at one time, but then it gets disconnected. And sometimes, even though disconnected, it can still bear fruit for a season. But if you're severed for any length of time and the roots are disconnected from, from the soil, it will no longer produce fruit. So you can't tell immediately. Sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, sometimes it may even be years. There's so much life in Jesus that you can be so connected to him that when a person becomes disconnected, they can still have the appearance as though there is life there, but yet they have been disconnected. And so sometimes Jesus is just uh, challenging his, his followers to remain in me. He's saying, I am the vine. I'm the trunk of the tree. You are the branches. He's saying, stay connected to me. Stay connected to me. And, and, and here's the reason that Jesus is giving this message. This is not just something out of the blue. Because in, in St. John chapter 6, I almost like to call it the demonic verse. Because it's St. John chapter 6 and verse 6 to 6. Jesus had talked about... Uh, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. But in John 6, 66, uh, it, it says that he turned to his disciples and his disciples, the Bible there says that many of his disciples walked no more with him. They went back and walked no more with him. They didn't remain because it got tough. Because they had not counted the cost of discipleship. You have to understand, Jesus was not just a person that set up a little church along the side of the road. Jesus was radical. 
And everything that he did because he was about establishing a heavenly kingdom got political folks upset and uneasy. And it, then it got religious folks, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Essenes. It got all of the, the Jewish systems upset and discombobulated. He, he, he shook up the status quo. So everything that was a, a status, an organized system, was shaken up because Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He didn't just come preaching love. A lot of people misunderstand what Jesus came preaching. He didn't just come preaching love. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is about the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven on the earth. When it says the kingdom of God, that tells you whose kingdom it is. When it says the kingdom of heaven, it lets you know where it is from. So, Jesus is coming as an ambassador from another dimension and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom that is a different way of doing things than what they have heard. Jesus said, you understand by the law that uh, if somebody asks you to go a mile, you know, with them, but Jesus said, I said, go with them too. And, and he said that somebody slaps you on one cheek, Jesus said, no, no, I said, offer them the other one. The law had said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus said, uh, 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 no, 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 I, I'm coming with something higher than that, deeper than that. And so Jesus brought us a different way. He's bringing, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And I want you to understand this. The gospel of the kingdom comes by demonstration. And so he says, when you see the blind healed, the lame walk, the dead raised, this becomes evidence that the gospel of the kingdom is at hand. This is a manifestation that the kingdom, a new kingdom had come. So Jesus is preaching a radically different kind of a gospel and people are upset about it. And so you have to risk your life to really follow this thing. And so Jesus said, I'm coming with some stuff. I might sound sweet and, and nice and like a meek little lamb. But he was a roaring lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and, and now he's saying, I want you to stay connected with me because it's going to get rough. We're going to go through some persecution. There are going to be some dark days with me and Jesus. But it's like, can you rock with me? Can you roll with me? Are you going to be my die, ride or die chick? He said, I'm looking for a bride. that will get on the back and not be asking me where we're going and are we there yet. But that can just trust me. That will lean with me when we get on a curve. I don't need anybody that's going to pull away from me. He said, I need somebody that knows how to lean with me. Jesus is saying, abide in me. Stay connected with me. I, he said, I want you to stay hooked up to me because where we're going, I'm going to need you to stay connected. And I want you to understand this. This connectedness, this connectedness is about our union with Jesus Christ. It is not merely just about being Christ-like. Christ-likeness is a byproduct of being connected to him. That's the byproduct. The real identity is to be in him, to be connected to him. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Stay connected. This is about being connected for the long haul. Don't let accusations, don't let persecutions, don't let uh, trouble don't let that stuff get you off the ship. Don't let it get you out of fellowship with him. This is about union with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And there's always a cost of discipleship. It's not cheap. This is not a cheap grace. Following Jesus cost us a reprioritization of everything. It cost you a reprioritization of everything in your life. Your relationships, I mean, this is a spousal relationship, your business relationships, your, your neighborhood relationships. This is about relationships. It's a reprioritization with your relationships. It's a reprioritization with what you value. It's a reprioritization with what you do with money. It's a reprioritization of how you do your job. This is a reprioritization of how you relate to people in your life. And it is a reprioritization of how you serve, how you treat others. 
Jesus comes and he reprioritizes your life. Your priorities shift and change when Jesus comes into the plate. When you get in, in connection with him, you abide in the vine when you're connected to him. I want you to notice what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Notice this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living and if need be in dying also. Jesus, Jesus is not playing here. He, he's saying if anybody desires to be my disciple, you know, as people have gotten popular now, they said, oh yes, I'm a Christ follower. Well, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a disciple, and I like the word disciple because the word disciple actually means learner learner. You learn his ways. You learn his attitudes. You learn his habits. You learn his mannerisms. That's why when you're connected to him, just by being around him, you're learning. You're learning. You're learning. He said, keep your eyes open because you're catching something. You're catching something. Everything that, that Jesus taught was not in a parable. Some of it was in how he walked and how he treated people and how he had compassion on people. And you have to just watch and see what he does. And, and then you'd pick up the mannerisms of Jesus. That when somebody accused him that Jesus didn't lose his temper and cuss him out. You, you know, it's about learning how to abide in him. And learning how to deny yourself. One of the other gospel writers, when he was talking about this, this verse here, he talked about if, if you want to be my disciple, that you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. You know, repentance is a daily thing. You have to die every day. You have to get on the cross every day. You have to crucify your flesh every day. You have to crucify your tongue every day. This is not just a thing to say, but oh, you know, back in 1938, I, that's, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. This is an onward going thing. This is a daily crucifixion. That when you rise up I I every day, you have to say that, you know what, if my marriage is going to live, it's going to live because I go to the cross today. I go to the cross today. I go to the cross today on my job. When, uh, as, I, as, I, as I serve in government, I go to the cross today. I die. I die. Let him deny himself. It didn't say indulge yourself. It didn't say just buffet yourself. It says let him deny, deny, uh, deny himself. Do you know this in the Bible? I know that it's not popular right now because we love to aggrandize the flesh. Jesus said, if, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Deny yourself, no, uh-uh. If you're going to walk in discipline, uh-uh. If you're going to walk in excellence, uh-uh. If you're going to reach the, the, the mark, uh-uh. I, I know you want, I know you want double macaroni and cheese. And that's your two vegetables. But he's just saying you got to, you can't eat all you want. You can't eat all you want. You have to deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. You can't say everything you, you feel. You have to deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. People have no filter. They eat everything. They, it's all you can eat. It's all you can say. Where's your filter? Jesus said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Deny you, uh-uh. You see people and they make that old nature want to come up in you, uh-uh. You're going to be my follower. Let him deny himself. Look at what he said in, in Matthew 16, verse 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You'd be surprised how much peace that you can have when you don't say everything you feel. You can't say everything you think. It's not healthy. Do you know it is a superpower not having to cave in and say everything that you feel and think. That's a superpower. You'd be surprised. 
Now, I know that there are things that you do need to get out. I'm not talking about repressing things that, that can bring liberty to your life. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just talking about folks that, that, that won't deny themselves in a way that allows them to reveal their connectedness to Jesus. You know when they can, uh, you know, accuse Jesus? The Bible says he opened not his mouth. He was like a sheep that was dumb before its shearer. He didn't try to say, hey, hey, hey I, I didn't do that. But you're ah, ah, ah. Jesus denied himself. Shh, shh, shh. Shh, something must be. Shh. Had he spoken up and tried to defend himself, he would have stopped God's will from being done. You don't ever know that just sometimes just, just Jesus saw and had a greater understanding of God's will. And so when you understand the bigger picture, it's easier to deny yourself because I, I'm denying myself here because I'm working on something. Are you listening? You have to have the big picture in mind that I, I'm, I'm working on something. That's why I deny myself because I'm, I'm working on something. I'm walking somewhere. I'm connected to somebody. When you're connected to somebody and you represent somebody else, you can't say everything you want to say. You can't do everything that you want to do. You can't go everywhere that you want to go. And Jesus said, you know, some people think, well, that's denying myself. That's, why, why should I have to de deny myself? We want to be a follower of Jesus. If, if you would save your life, and it's interesting that uh, the Greek word here, save your life, it is the word translated as life here is the word suke. It's saving your soul. And there's some people trying to save their soul, their mind, their suke and they end up losing it, trying to preserve it. And Jesus said, listen, if you lose it, if you lose your way of thinking and gain my way of thinking, that's when you'll have life. That's when you'll have peace if you'll do it my way. It won't give you consternation on the inside if you'll do it my way, if you'll do it my way. And that's very interesting here that he's, he's letting them know that if you if you'll just do it my way, if you'll just hang in there, you can get through this. But I want you to be with me, Jesus was saying, for the long haul. This is not a fly-by-night. This is not a, a fad. This, this is not just a, another movement that's a passing thing in Christianity. This Jesus said, I want you to walk with me for the long haul. Be connected with me for life. He's like, we're connected now for life. Notice Mark 13, 13. Jesus was letting them know, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one endures to the end. The one who endures to the end is going to be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end is going to be saved. He says, you're going to, be, you're going to have to go through some things for, uh, uh, on account of me. And uh, see, the discomfort that, that we have to endure it's absolutely nothing to compare with the glory that awaits us in the future. There's something greater that awaits us. Uh, Paul talked about it at writing to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 in the Phillips translation. Notice what it says. In my opinion, whatever we may have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future that God has planned for us. I mean, what we've got to go through now, he's saying... He said, this is nothing compared with the magnificent future that God has planned for us. And, and here's what people miss it. They, they like all of kind of stuff that's extreme and intense. They, they, they like it. That's why they like reality shows with people fighting and scratching each other's eyeballs out and snatching their weave out and fighting like cats and dogs. They love that because... The intensity of it, just we have an a, adrenaline rush for stuff when we see people doing crazy stuff. That it makes us junkies for that stuff. Because intensity, intensity makes a great story. But consistency makes progress. Consistency makes progress. Jesus said, if you'll walk with me, Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me consistently, consistently, consistently. Stay connected with me. We're in this for the long haul. If we'll do this consistently, consistency builds progress. 
Consistency builds progress. Consistency builds progress. You can go out to putt-putt golf and be a beginner and, you know, and, and get a hole in one. And it's beginner's luck. But the difference between an amateur and a pro is one word, consistency. The pro knows how to hit it consistently. The amateur lucks up and does it, but he can't duplicate it because he doesn't know what he did to bring about that result. And so intensity gives us such a sensational story, but consistency builds progress. Consistency builds progress. And yes, I know that it's really hard to be consistent. In fact, I would say it to this degree, it's a sacrifice to be consistent. Present your body as a living sacrifice, just consistently, consistently. I want you to understand this point. Sacrifice improves the future. Sacrifice improves the future. I don't care what it is. If you sacrifice with the discipline and what you do with your money in terms of your spending budget, if you exercise and sacrifice in your budget, it'll improve your future. If you sacrifice and study, it will improve your future. If you sacrifice and work on your marriage, it will improve your future. If you work on your skills, sacrifice to do that, it will improve your future. I know you already go to work every day and you work on a job that you may not be passionate about, but then if you'll come home and sacrifice and work on what your real God call is and sacrifice, are you listening? It will improve your future because sacrifice always improves your future. 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 That's why Jesus said, you're going to follow me, be my disciple? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. It's a sacrifice to do that, but sacrifice always improves your future. Sacrifice always improves your future. And let me just say that when things don't seem right in your life, check to see whether or not you're still connected to the source. When you get frustrated, easily angered, check to see whether or not you're still connected to the source. Check to see whether or not you're still connected to the source. I mean, for 10 years, I worked in information systems as a manager there. And uh, every now and then, back then in those days, we but had these big expensive mainframe systems. And when I would have a, a problem that was above my pay grade, I'd have to call IBM. And, and it would be insulting because I'd already done this for years and I would get there and, and the person would, would, would say to me, have you checked to make sure that the computer is plugged in? <laughs> and I'm saying in the back of my mind, what kind of dunce do you think I am? I didn't just start doing this. I've been doing this a while now. You're asking me, is the machine plugged in? I came to find out that on a large percentage of their calls, people were saying, my screen is totally black. I can't get it to turn on. The thing was, somebody had pulled it out of the plug. It wasn't plugged into the power source. And people will have stuff going wrong in their life, and they'll wonder what's wrong. And Jesus said, you know, abide in the vine. Abide in me. Stay plugged in all the time. Stay plugged into me so you won't lose your power. Stay plugged into me so you won't lose your power. Stay plugged into me so you don't lose your power. You got to plug into me so you don't lose your power. Always check to see whether or not you are plugged in to the power source. Check to see whether you're plugged in to the power source. Whenever you feel frustrated, whenever you feel inadequate, just check to see whether or not you're plugged in to the power source of his presence because you may be disconnected from his presence. Notice what Psalm 1611 says. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
So if you are irritable and frustrated all the time, check to see whether you're still plugged into his presence. Because when you get in God's presence, that, there's a certain kind of peace and calm that comes over you. An ability that, that helps you to be able to deny yourself because you're plugged into the power source. You can't do that on your own string. But when you're connected to the one who epitomized self-sacrifice, it empowers you then. You become strengthened, empowered as a result of that. Let me just remind you that our walk of faith with Jesus Christ is not a sprint, but it's a marathon with hurdles. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon with hurdles and curves. I want you to notice what Jesus said. Uh, uh, the, the scripture, the action of the writer of the book of Hebrews, in reference to Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, notice this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Now notice, it'll either slow you down or trip you up. And let us run with endurance. Word patience means endurance. In it for the long haul, the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on the competition, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne because he sacrificed and it improved his future. And I want you to notice that it's not only sin that slows us down and trips us up, but it's also weights, just weights. I mean, there is nothing more that will slow you down than extra weight. I, I, I mean, I, my wife and I were looking at this, you know, this series on my 600-pound life. You can imagine, I mean, it, some of these folks were over 600 pounds. When they were able to walk, they couldn't walk very fast because weight will slow you. It'll slow you down. Uh, there are a lot of people that ride around in their automobiles with too much junk in the trunk. And they don't realize they, they're carrying extra weight. It causes you to burn more fuel. And you're just riding right. It's not that you're taking it somewhere. You just hadn't, brought, you just hadn't emptied the weight out of your trunk. And you're carrying it around burning extra gas because weight requires energy to move it and to pull it. And can you imagine your commute to work and back home every day with extra stuff in the car that you didn't need for the journey? You're burning more gas? Save your fuel. Lay aside the weight and the sin. Lay aside the weight. Lay aside the weight. Lay aside the weight. You'd be surprised how much lighter you feel when you lose weight, when you've been overweight. It, it takes energy and effort to move that. It's, it's, it's murder on your joints, on your knees and your hips and your ankles. It's murder on your back. But when you lighten the load, when you lay aside the, the weight, it, 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 it moves you. And see, uh, remember, we're not just talking about physical weight. Sometimes this weight are people that are drainers in your life. Just drainers. Have you thought about uh, the weights that's in your life? You thought about that lately? The weights that's in your life? I mean, people who constantly need something from you. Excess video gaming. Excess social media. Uh, reliving your past failures. All of these are, these are weights. Worrying. It's just excessive stress. A poor self-image. It's, it's a weight. Negative thinking or wrong thinking. That's a, it's a weight. Let us lay aside the, the weight. It's not just sin that messes you up. It's just weight. It's the weight of what happened to you as a little girl. It's the weight of what happened to you as a little boy. It's the abuse. It's the abandonment. It's the molestation. It's the rejection. It's the comparison. It's a weight. Always trying to live up to somebody else's expectation of you. Jesus said, come and, and learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm not going to put all of that extra stuff on you. 
for you to try to do. He says, just die to yourself. Just die to yourself. And see, we are encouraged to run the race that God has set before us with endurance. And I want you to notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, God will bless you for this. If you endure the pain of undeserved suffering because you are cautious of his will. Notice that. You can endure the suffering if you're cautious of God's will. If you just know why I'm going through this, you will be surprised if you understand that there's glory on the other side of this. That God is preparing me. This is to prepare me for something in my future here. God's, God's working on something in my life. God's building a stamina in me. He's building a strength of character in me. If you understand that what I'm going through right now in this moment, that everything that I went through in my childhood was to prepare me so I wouldn't be a wimp as an adult when challenges of life that come with you that are not going to treat you like a little spoiled brat, it's going to come at you full force. And he said, I let you go through that so you can handle this. Because now when you went through that as a, as a child, now you think that somebody's going to ruin your day because you walk in and they don't speak to you? And you've already been abused and you've already come through hell and high water and you've already had to put cardboards in your shoes just because of the holes that were there and now you think that somebody talking about how your hair is is going to jack your day up? Is that the best shot that you've got? Let me give you a definition for endurance because we're talking about for the long haul. Endurance is the power to embrace an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving up. It's not deep, it's simple. I'll screenshot it so you can get it. It's the power to embrace an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving up. It's always going to be undifficult. And you know, I mean, endurance, endurance, you know, because you, you, you'll be there and you'll be like, you know, there's something, you can have this. But endurance is, is the power to embrace the unpleasantness of that moment or the unpleasantness of some undeserved suffering uh, or, or, or a, a difficult process. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard when it's unpleasant. To do that, but you have to, when you endure it, it's, it's, it's approaching it without giving up. It's being empowered to embrace it as a part of the process because it equips you for something. You see, when we run with endurance, you're looking away from everything that is distracting us, and then you're focusing your eyes on Jesus, who is the author of your faith and the finisher of it. He's the one that brought it into manifestation. He authored it, and he's the one that fulfills it. He's the perfecter of it. He's the one that matures it. He gave it to us. Looking unto Jesus, it means that we are looking away from every distraction, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Jesus endured this thing by fixing his eyes on the will of God that was already set before him. He understood something. He was, he, for the joy that was set before him, his eyes were set on something already. Jesus' eyes were set on something. Let me give you just a few tips of some things that improve our endurance. Prayer, prayer, prayer. You know why? Because prayer can help you to understand the will of God in light of the big picture prayer. It helps you to understand the will of God. You know, when you pray through, it's until you get a peace in that thing, realizing that God's got me, even though this process is difficult, even though this thing is just very uncomfortable. Prayer, prayer, it improves your endurance. Here's another thing, eating healthily. There are certain ingredients and nutrients that actually nourish the body so that you actually have greater stamina, staying power, greater endurance. When you nourish your body with the right type of nutrients, it gives you better endurance, better endurance. Uh, regular exercise builds your endurance. It builds your endurance. I mean, if you're going to run a marathon, you need to start running. And start with one mile and then two. But do it regularly. Do it regularly and start increasing it little by little. Regular exercise improves our uh, endurance. Here's another thing, a good night's sleep. A good night's sleep 
If you become sleep deprived, it, 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 it messes up your, your, your endurance. Tiredness makes a coward of most people. You get tired, you just don't want to, you don't want to do it. You, 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 you lay down anywhere. A good night's sleep improves your endurance. Here's another thing, a good coach. You get a good coach, I mean, they're going to push you when you would quit on yourself. But it, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I almost fired a coach one time because I had him working with me and, you know, and I'm paying him to agonize me. <laughs> and I'm already shaking the night. Like, come on, give me five more. And then they're pushing out and come on, four more. And, you know, I would not have done the extra five had the coach not been there. Trust me. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a good coach. Here's another thing that can improve your endurance is a running buddy. Get somebody to walk the journey with you. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Sometimes it, it, it may be your wife. Maybe your husband. It may be your best friend. Don't, don't do it alone. You know, I started the ministry. I started with, with, my, with my wife. She's my, my ride or die partner. And I needed help in the earlier days. And I had my wife, you know, working as in, in, in accounting. And had she not been my wife, I would have fired her because she got a year behind. A, a, a year, not two weeks, a year. And then I had to hire somebody. But you know, in the early days, you're not, you're not able to afford to hire the help you need. And so you just... Whoever's available to you, come in here, boy. Come on. Come on in here, girl. You just need help. Whether they went to school for that or not. And she didn't go to school for that. But when you're building something, you need help. From any source you can get it. You just sometimes need a running buddy. Just come on, do this with me. Uh, it is a proven fact that geese can fly 75% farther in formation with other geese than they can alone. You'd be surprised just getting a running buddy, just a, a running buddy in your neighborhood. Get a, get a walking buddy, just somebody else, because there are going to be some days it's going to be cold out there, but if you've got another buddy that's, that's going to de 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 be dependent on, on you being up and ready, it'll push you. Sometimes your walking buddy might be a dog. You put a leash on them, and they got to go out in the morning when you got an indoor dog and so you may as well get a get a walking but it'll help your endurance here's another thing a targeted goal a targeted goal you set a goal and and somehow goals have pulling power because they cause us to focus and they improve your endurance because if you know that I'm trying to do 20 of these today you start off trying to do push-up you do 10 and then if you have a goal to do 20 just that goal can cause your endurance to improve and, and here's what I want you to get, that the essence of what empowers us to endure is to see the E-N-D, the end from the beginning, hence you have the end door. You see the end from the beginning. See the end from the beginning. That's how God works. God always sees the end from the beginning. He sees the end from the beginning. And let me just remind you of this, Satan is tempting us by always offering us what is temporal while God is helping us to work on that which is eternal. God's focus for us is always eternal. And I just want to encourage you that whenever you feel like giving up, Jesus said, remain connected to me, stay in me, abide in me. Be in this thing for the long haul with me. Whenever you feel like giving up, and let me, let me just tell you from personal experience, Anybody that has ever done anything worth doing was tempted to give up. And let me, let me, let me just, just remind you of this. Giving up is nothing more than a temptation. And the same way that you talk yourself into giving up, you can talk yourself into not giving up. Are you listening? So whenever you get to that place that you're tempted to quit, here's a strategy. Look at your why. Look at your why. Look at your why. You didn't give yourself the vision. You didn't give yourself the dream. You didn't give yourself the calling. Look at the why. 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 Look 
at the why. The why will push you when you don't feel like going. The why will pull you when you're dragging. The why will empower you to endure when you feel like quitting. And the why will help you to get back up when you've stumbled and fallen. You get back up because somebody else believed in you. Because somebody made an investment. Because somebody prayed for you. Because somebody is dependent upon you. I can't tell you the number of mothers and fathers that get up and go to work and do things that they don't even like to do because they got a why over there in the bed. That I'm not doing this for myself. I've got to get out and do this because there's somebody else who's dependent on me. Somebody's dependent. Look at your why. Look at your why. It'll push you. Your why will pull you. Your why will give you staying power. Your why will help you to get back up if you've made a mistake, if you fail. Your why will not let you just wallow there. I understand that there are evil people in the world and sometimes life will hit you with blows that will knock you down. Jesus stumbled and fell with his cross. Don't be shocked if you fall with yours. But he didn't stay there. And you're not at fault for falling down. But if I come by three hours later and you're still there, I'm going to start looking at you side-eyed. If I come by next week and you're still on the ground, if I see you three months from now and you're still wallowing because somebody knocked you down, and if I see you three years down the road, and you're still wallowing, making excuses, it is your fault. You need to reconnect to your source so you become empowered by your why. Why did you start to begin with? Every time that you attempted to quit, remember why you started. Every time you attempted to quit, remember why you started. Every time you get ready to walk out on the relationship, remember why you started. And just remember that every day, every day, every day, you got to die. It's a sacrifice that will improve your future. It is a sacrifice that will improve your future. It is a sacrifice that will improve your future. I'm just telling you. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, 35, so do not throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. You need patient endurance. He says you need endurance so that you'll continue to do God's will, then you will receive all that He has promised. But you can't get the promise. The promise is only after you've done the will of God. After you've done the will of God, then you shall inherit the promise. That's His Word. Hebrews 10, 36. And you're going to need endurance to finish your course. James chapter 1, verse 12 reminds us that God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. The thing about testing and temptation, every test is temporary. Every temptation is temporary. God blesses those who patiently endure it. How can you endure it? Because it's passing. It won't last forever. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. Because quitting it's just a temptation. Don't give in to it. Don't give in to it. Talk yourself out of quitting. And every time that you feel like quitting, look to Jesus, who despising the shame while he was on the cross, 
endured. Looking, looking. Jesus was looking to something else. He wasn't looking at where he was and what he was going through. Looking to the joy. He was looking on the other side of that. He was looking at the end of it already. From the beginning, he was looking at the end. Jesus was looking at the end from the beginning. He was already seeing himself in glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. He was already seeing himself on the other side of this. He was already seeing himself operating in the vision that God had already shown everything that he had been prepared for, for the foundation of the earth. He was looking at it, the end of it from the beginning. And when you look at Jesus, it'll awaken something in you that will become relentless and tenacious. When you look at Jesus, my God, it will awaken the champion on the inside of you. When you look to him, when you abide in him, when you realize that I'm in this for the long haul, even when it gets difficult and when people begin to talk about you, because some of this stuff that they're saying is Christianity is really not Christianity. It's too convenient. It's too sweet. It's too easy. The kind of Christianity that Jesus talks about will cause people that don't know him to hate on you to say all kind of evil against you and to work against you. You'll walk into places and folks won't even like you and you'll be saying, I didn't even do anything to them. This is not about you. It's about who you represent. It's about who you are connected to. Uh, it's something about it that you go into a place and people won't like you and you don't even understand it. And it has to do with the fact that their demons don't like the Christ in you. And whenever, whenever, whenever Jesus steps into the room with a demon, they recognize. Yes, they do. And you'll walk in minding your own business. But when you're connected to the vine, the spirit of Jesus in you makes their demons uncomfortable. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And this is why I declare that we have to have a resolve in our own hearts and spirits to be just like the Apostle Paul who said in 2 Timothy 4-7, I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. And if you finish a race, trust me, you will be tempted to quit because you will get tired. And you'll get thirsty. And you'll be dehydrated. And sometimes you'll get dizzy and sometimes you'll get cramps. And nobody ever talks about that. Sometimes your feet will hurt and your ankle will turn over. But he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You do that by abiding in the vine. And I just encourage you today, don't let persecution, difficulty uproot you from your Christian faith. Don't let challenge and unpopular, or, or I should say popular themes in the culture that are antithetic to the Bible and to the way of Jesus. Don't let that cause you to quit. We have to be determined that we're going to be in this thing for the long haul. It's not popular today to say that you're going to follow Jesus and deny yourself and take up your cross. Because the world keeps giving you this message that you deserve this and you deserve that and you deserve the other. But until you sacrifice, you don't improve your future. You got to go to that cross every day. Repentance is a daily process. It's a process. It is a consistency that brings progress, that helps you to stay in right standing with Jesus Christ. Every day there's some stuff out there that's draining your energy. And Jesus said, you need to plug back into me, stay connected to me, so your power doesn't run low. You got to stay connected. There are people that go dark because they haven't been in his presence. And he's just saying, abide in me. 
Because when Jesus challenged them to eat his flesh and to drink his blood, the Bible says many, many of his disciples, many of his disciples, John 6 and verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him. Many, many, not just a few, many. And then he turns to some of them and says, will you, will you leave me also? And they said, Master, where, where are we going? You have the words of eternal life. Where, what can we get that's better than you? When you have tasted and seen, oh, taste and see. There's something about putting his word in your mouth that opens your eyes. That's why we meditate on him. That's why we think about him. That's why you have to be determined that I don't care if my Sunday school teacher goes to hell. I'm not going behind them. If your grandmama, your granddaddy, I mean, you can love them. But you know, that's what we part ways. When you lead down the road to hell, and if I'm trying to tell you of a Savior, and you understand which direction he is, We live in a world where our kingdom of our God is in conflict with the kingdom of the world. And if you're not in conflict, you must not be in connection. Because to connect with Christ puts you in conflict with the world. And he who is a friend of the world is at enmity with God. And he's just saying, I'm looking for my ride or die folks that's in this for the long haul. That when they talk about us and persecute us and call us all kind of names and lame and Jesus freaks and goody two shoes and righteous this and say what you will. Say what you will. I'm in it for the, for the long haul. And every time they say things to us that are unkind and mean-spirited, come back to that cross take our cross Jesus told him you take your cross and I want you to understand Jesus gave these directives before he ever went to the cross Jesus said if anybody will be my disciple and follow me they must take up their cross and follow me daily this is a daily walk Jesus said those words before he went to the cross. Before he took up his cross, he said, you got to take up your words. Because there's a cost of discipleship. And if you think that you make it to heaven by cheap grace, you don't understand the cost of his blood. There's nothing cheap about it. It cost him everything, not something. It cost him everything. And now he challenges us. So Jesus, always with his real true followers, says, follow me. Let's do this for the long haul. And he's saying other folks became destabilized in their faith and abandoned the faith. But he says, I want you to hold on and abide in me. Stay in me. Let my words stay in you. And you'll have life and bear much fruit and herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit I pray that you've gotten something out of the word of the Lord today I really do hallelujah to the Lamb of God hallelujah hallelujah bow your heads for just a moment those of you that are joining us through the live stream Jesus loves you right where you are I know it seems easy to just pray a prayer and accept Jesus Christ to come into your heart that is a simple part. But the real challenge is the daily commitment. This is not just a cheap thing to say that you can just pray a prayer and you never have to do anything else. Jesus said, no, 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 no. If you're going to love me, you keep my commandments. There's an obedience. And you can't even obey unless you die to yourself. Obedience is sacrifice. It causes you to sacrifice your will and your way. Jesus is inviting you to a sacrifice. A sacrifice, a sacrifice, blood-bodied, that's sacrifice. 
They're called sacraments because it's about sacrifice, sacrifice. It's performing the sacred sacrifice. And he's calling you to sacrifice your will and your way and to surrender your life to Jesus. And if you realize that you've not surrendered your life to Jesus, this is not a one-time thing. You do it every day. The way you say, Lord, I give you my life today. I die to my flesh, to my own will, my own way, so that you can live in me. And if you need to receive him, wherever you are, this simple prayer will do it. Dear Father, I acknowledge that I have missed the mark. I know that you died for me and pray, paid a huge price for my life. You gave your all so that I could have you and eternal life. And today, I open my heart and accept you to come in and live in me. Transform me. Give me a love for your word, for attendance in your house, and for fellowship with other believers. Use my testimony to tell everyone I meet about you. And may I grow in you day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that in the earnestness of your heart, you're on a journey now. Tomorrow you renew your commitment to him. His mercies are made new to you every single day. It's not that once you can pray that little prayer and then you go and live any kind of way that you want to live. Jesus said, no, no, no. Stay connected to me. Let my words abide in you. You abide in my words. Let my word abide in you. Because it'll transform your life. This is a process. He says, this is not about the exciting thing, about intensity, about somebody laying hands and something powerful happens. That's, that's a catalyst. But the real development comes in a day-to-day -day walking with Jesus, praying, searching the scriptures, and allowing God to so gradually transform you that only people who haven't encountered you in a while will then see you over a period of time and and say, hey, something's different about you. And the secret of that, the secret sauce, is in what you're doing every day with Jesus. Taking up your cross daily and dying. It is the real cost of discipleship. There is no such a thing as a salvation that costs you nothing. It'll cost you everything that you've got, but it'll give you everything that he's got. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.